I must tell you about a brother of mine who's a, a doctor here in New York in order to illustrate a certain point I wish to get over. When we were children, we used to visit every Sunday afternoon an old couple whom we were taught to call familiarly Uncle Bill and Aunt Hannah. And in the course of the visit, my young brother Tom always used to ask Uncle Bill for a dime. He started this whole affair. <laughs> Except he grew out of it. <laughs> and one day my mother said to him, Now, Tom, the next time we visit Uncle Bill, please do not ask him for anything. They're very poor, and they can ill afford to give you a dime. Now, will you promise, Mother, that you will not ask? And he said, I promise. We made the visit the following Sunday. Tom was very good, but just as we were driving away, he said, Uncle Bill, you know. <laughs> now, the only point of the story that I wish to get across is that those of you who are knowing and loving will know what I mean when I say, thanks, thanks, thanks. May the Lord bless you. The burden of this telecast is to be the meaning of Christmas, but in order to do it, we must give you some philosophies of life. Uh, Chesterton once said that a philosophy of life was extremely important. He said that when you go to visit a dentist, before the dentist begins to drill your tooth, he has a right to ask you, what is your philosophy of life? Because if your philosophy of life is wrong, he can't be sure that you will pay your bill. <laughs> An old wise Socrates once said, marry. If your wife is good, you'll be happy. If she's an old shrew, you'll become a philosopher. <laughs> Socrates became a philosopher. <laughs> there are only two philosophies of life, basically. And one philosophy of life is this. It is that of man who goes to perfection or happiness or God by and through his own efforts. This is the philosophy, for example, of Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, philosophy of the ancient Greeks. One reached happiness, it was assumed, by contemplating the gods, or as the Eastern religions still believe, by some form of ascesis and self-discipline, by which, for example, in the Eightfold Path of Buddha, you crush all desires and eventually achieve some kind of perfection. This happens to be the philosophy of many today who have a queer kind of psychologism which often goes by the name, wrongly enough, of Christianity. They hope that by rearranging their mental states, or by passing on torches to fellow man, or by doing something fairly good in the natural order, that they will attain some kind of perfection. Now, that philosophy of life is actually not very solid. And the reason it is not is because we have to recognize that we cannot lift ourselves by our own bootstraps. <clears throat> cannot lift ourselves by the lobes of our ears. And we all know that barbarism is not something that is behind us. It is something that is beneath us. We know that there is a beast that dwells within us. And at any moment, that beast might break loose. Furthermore, there's a limit to what we can know. And even when we do know, we have enough moral codes. We are powerless to do. There is nothing that gives man such a jolt as being thrown back on his own resources. 
So there's another philosophy of life. And it is just the opposite. Instead of man going up this way to God, it operates this way. God comes down to man. And this is the true valid experience of the soul. For the soul responds to something rather than takes the initiative. There's a world of difference between the two. Here all the initiative is on the part of man. Here man responds to something. We too often think, for example, that, well, if we have a little spark of love, that God will show himself as the flame. Or if we dress up real nice and wear the costume of virtue, that God will be very pleased and he'll begin to love us. That isn't the way it operates at all. God loved us first. A man who's born blind and by an operation sees might at one time think that, oh, the sun just begins and the mountains and valleys and the rivers and streams are just appearing. They were always there. He just discovered them. Every child, when he reaches the age of six or seven, begins to realize that the mother loves him. No, the mother always loved him. The mother loved him before he was born. That is why, incidentally, many never realize how much their parents love them until they begin to be parents themselves. But the love is first. So religion is fundamentally a response rather than an initiative on the part of man. And that's the way nature works. Now let me show you the universe. Here's the hierarchy of creation. Uh, this is a peculiar way to, to draw the world and the universe. You know, sometimes when you think of the condition the world is in now, you sometimes wish that Noah had missed the boat. <laughs> And for the benefit of those who think the world owes them a living, it's well to remember that the world was here before they were. <laughs> well, this is the hierarchy of creation. At the bottom are chemicals, then plants, then animals, then man. Running through the universe is this law. Nothing ever mounts to a higher level except the higher thing comes down to it. For example, if the chemicals, the phosphates, the moisture, the air, the sunshine are to be living things, the plant must come down to them. The plant must descend to them. And if the plant could speak, the plant would say, unless you die to your lower existence, you cannot live in my kingdom. But if you die to this lower existence that you have, you will begin to be a living, palpitating thing. And continuing it, if, for example, the plants, mustn't forget how to spell, otherwise I get a thousand letters. <laughs> C-H-E-M-I-C-A-L-S, chemicals. <laughs> if the plant is ever to live in the animal, the animal must come down to the plant. And if the animal could speak, it would say to the plant, unless you die to this lower existence that you have, unless you were torn up from here the roots and the earth, unless you were ground beneath the jaws of death, you cannot live in my kingdom. But if you will surrender your lower existence and be responsive to me, then you will be not just a living thing, then you will be sentient. You can see 
You can hear. You can touch. You can move. And if the animal is ever to live in man, man must come down to the animal, lift it up, say to it, you can live a higher life, but you must be responsive, submit yourself to the knife, to the fire. Then you will be a thinking, willing creature that knows science and art, and that with a mind can scan the universe and read the secret of the stars. But shall evolution stop here in progress? Chemicals have no right to say there's no life above them. Plants have no right to say there's no life above them. So there is a higher life above man. And that higher life is God. And if man is ever to be lifted up, God in some way must come down to man. But it is not that simple. These are natures, not persons. The oxygen is not free. The cabbage has no liberty. The animal has no personality, no rights. But man has. These things can be appropriated one by the other by sheer force. But not even the God who made man free would destroy his freedom. If man is ever to be taken up, he will have to go through some process of discipline, it is true. But if he's ever to be taken up, there must be a free act on the part of man. And one day there came out from the great white throne of light an angel of light an angel. See, have you noticed how common angels are now? For Christmas, isn't it wonderful? <laughs> An angel came out from the great white throne of light and descended down over the plain plains of Esdralin and came to a woman kneeling in prayer. And through the angel, God said to the woman, Will you... Give me a man. Will you give me a human nature? Speaking in the name of all humanity, will you, by an act of freedom, say, Here is a man. And she said, Fiat, be it done. The woman's mission is submission. Surrender. And that man could not be without love, without fire without passion. But there are other fires than those of the flesh and other passions than those of Eros. And the fire and the passion and the love that descended upon her was the spirit and the flame and the love of God. Nine months passed. And one night, that rang out over the stillness of an evening breeze. Out over the white chalked hills of Bethlehem, a cry, a gentle cry. The 
The sea did not hear the voice, for the sea was filled with its own cry. The great ones of the earth did not hear the cry, for they could not understand how a child could be greater than a man. There were only two classes of people who heard the cry that night. Shepherds and wise men. Shepherds, those who know they know nothing. Wise men, those who know they do not know everything. The very simple, the very learned, never the man with one book. Never the man who thinks that he knows. And when they came, they saw a babe whose tiny hands were not quite long enough to touch the huge heads of the cattle. And yet a babe was steering the sun and moon and stars in their courses. Baby feet that did not walk. They could not bear the weight of divine omnipotence. Eyes, eyes that might have read the secrets of every living heart that hour. Under that baby brow was beating a mind and an intelligence that formed the universe, along with a human intelligence that would grow an age and grace and wisdom before God and men. And this babe who was born was not a man who made himself a god, was not a man who was an ethical reformer, not just a teacher like Buddha or Socrates, not someone who would develop a consciousness of Godhead as he went on, but someone who from all eternity was God and began to be in time the only one on earth that ever had a prehistory, a prehistory to be studied, not in the dust and the slime of primeval jungles, but in the bosom of an eternal father. It shatters our proud minds to think of it. And think of that great and wise the very learned poet Francis Thompson, whose poetry staggers us with its learning. And one Christmas Eve, he went into a crib near where he lived, church nearby where he lived in England. And he stood there as this great wise man and thought himself as a child and thought of God coming down to this earth as a babe. And then his mind became simple, divinely simple, and he, he said in his poem, Little Jesus, wast thou shy once? And just as small as I? And how did it feel like to be? Out of heaven, and just like me. I should think that I would cry for my house all made of sky. And the tweaking would distress me. Not an angel there to dress me. Hadst thou ever any toys? Like us little girls and boys? And didst thou play with all the angels that were not too tall, with stars for marbles? Did the things play, can you see me through their wings? Did thy mother let thee spoil thy robes by playing on our soil? How nice to have them always new, because in heaven it was quite clean blue. 
Did thy mother at the night kiss thee and fold thy clothes in tight? And didst thou feel quite good in bed, kissed and sweet, and thy prayer said, Oh, thou canst not have forgotten all that it feels like to be small. Then take me by the hand and walk and listen to my baby talk. That was just his way of understanding omnipotence in bonds, the maker of the stars under the stars, and the creator of the earth, not having place whereon to lay his head. And what does it mean? Why did he come? He did not come to make us nice people. He came to make us new men, to change our natures, as everything else in nature is being changed by lifted up. Just suppose, for example, this block of marble suddenly began to bloom. Why, that would be something that does not belong to the powers or the natures or the needs of marble. Suppose these flowers suddenly began to move about from one place on the stage to another, as an animal might, seeking out first camera one, then camera two, and then camera three. That would be something that certainly does not belong to the nature of flowers. And suppose a dog should suddenly walk across the stage and begin to recite Shakespeare. <laughs> well, that would be something certainly that does not belong to the nature of a dog. And suppose any of us who are just creatures, just men, suddenly began to be children of God so that the divine nature began to pulsate within us so that we were lifted up by offering our human nature as Mary offered the first human nature so that we could in a lesser way be united with his divine person so that his truth would know all that great wisdom would begin to flood our minds and then his will and his love would begin to possess us and would impregnate and suffuse itself over every single love that we had. Oh, if that ever came to pass, and it does come to pass, that would be the meaning of Christmas. That's why the Son of God came to this earth, to make us other sons of God, to make us more than just human beings. It's not easy. It's very hard. You say, oh, but I'm a, I'm a beast. I'm foul. I dare not be lifted up. Remember that he was laid in a manger and his companions were beasts. That is our hope, our joy, our peace, our merry Christmas. It began here, in the upper room, 2,000 years ago. This is my body. This is my blood. Remember me. In a garden he prayed to his father on a night of betrayal, torture, death, far from Galilee. When taken from his rack of torment, in a borrowed grave he lie. On the third day the angel said, He has risen, he did not die. After sharing with friends, he rose to the Father, leaving his spirit love to guide our journey. For he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, together again. People of all faiths recognize Bishop Fulton J. Sheen as one of the greatest communicators of the 20th century. He was born in El Paso, Illinois, in May of 1896. As a young boy, he knew he wanted to be a priest. He served as an altar boy at St. Mary's Cathedral in Peoria, Illinois. At St. Viator College, his education and debating skills taught him the skills he used throughout his life. His unique ability at being natural and at ease in front of any audience was noted early in his ministry. He was ordained in 1919 
and went on to become one of the best-known and greatly loved priests in church history. He wrote 96 books and hundreds of articles and columns. He broadcast numerous radio and TV programs. People from all faiths watched him on television because he spoke to every man. They always waited with joy for his goodbye, his blessing, God love you. It continues to give us joy and memories. Bye now, and God love you. Bishop Fulton J. Sheen went to be with the Lord in December of 1979. Fulton J. Sheen, requiescat in pace.